disability and not be affected by it. And so I've been enormously privileged to be able to um, work with um, and learn from the folks I've been able to live, learn from and work with for the last decade and a half. And there is so much traditional knowledge with respect to fire and so many other things that is incredibly relevant for um, settlers, non-Native communities to, um, to become aware of. I think, you know, many people think of climate change as an extension of colonialism. And uh, in that sense, Indigenous communities have been on the forefront of resisting and thinking about alternatives and how we need to change course for a long time. And there's a great deal uh, to learn from, and I think it's incumbent upon us the non-native environmental movement to be following the lead of indigenous indigenous communities. Do you think that we are listening enough? Uh, I think that there's a, some sign that change is happening, but I think absolutely not. You know the um, and I you know the 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 dynamics, both cultural and political, are very different between Canada and the United States on this one. But uh, you know there there's lim- very limited awareness of of uh, the ongoing existence of indigenous communities, what their struggles look like, much too little sense of other, you know, whether it's environmental groups, understanding how the things they advocate for can actually increase harm in indigenous communities. And there's a huge amount of learning and, and work to be done. You know, I was just thinking about social justice and climate change and wondering if the uh, if the fix for humanity is a technological fix or whether it's just simply asking the elders. Well, it's we're living in a time when the kind of wisdom that, that indigenous communities have had is, is a very different kind of time. And so uh, one of the things I think that's true for um, many traditions, I was just at a friend's bat mitzvah two days ago and um, you know, this 13-year-old was was tasked with uh, figuring out how do um, those texts, what's the, what do we draw from them today? And I think that certainly indigenous communities are 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 taking those kind of steps themselves. And so it, you know, there is a lot of wisdom in figuring out how we change, how we draw upon that today um, is a task at hand. And you know, so as a sociologist, we we think about technological fix. Technologies are very um, shaped by the social conditions within <laughs> which they're in and, and in turn make new uh, social conditions. So I don't think that you can have a technological fix on its own from within a system that's organized around fossil fuel and, and capitalism and all of the, the um, growth imperative you know, technologies are not going to change that. We have to have cultural shifts as well, but technologies can lead to cultural shifts if if they're they're done, um, you know, in a, in that with that intention or introduced. Kari, a couple of last questions. One is, uh, who are the people that influence you the most in your work? Um, thank you for asking that. Well, certainly, you know, there's so many. Um, people that who you know I draw upon and for any of us we're only able to do the thinking that we're doing um, because of the people around us and the people that have walked before us and uh, the people that walk, walk alongside us now so um, certainly you know my credit colleagues are, are enormously influential on a day-to-day basis in terms of the particular of knowledge that they have but also their integrity and approach uh, to their work and to life and um, you know both my parents were very influential to me in terms of the idea that we have a responsibility to um, to give back to the world, um, as well as you know other mentors, um, people in the academic community. Any suggested authors? Any any faves? Um, I love the work of uh, Robert J. Lifton, who has a new book um, out called The Climate Swerve. And I also leaned heavily. He doesn't do climate work, but um, Eviatar Zerubovo does work on the social organization of denial, but that, for listeners, may be a little too far off. Um, and then in terms of just uh, people who are struggling to make sense with climate change, I really like Rebecca Solnit's work. I have here on my shelf her book, Hope in the Dark, um, but she's done other many other things, uh, Paradise Built in Hell. And I also really, I don't... Um, 
read all of Derek Jensen's work, but he has an essay, an older essay called Beyond Hope, which is mm-hmm. uh, short and quite wonderful. And what's on your wish list? Uh, <laughs> the things you'd like to see changed. What What do you think is manageable? Well, I don't know. You know, I think none of us know what we can do, um, but we need to figure out what to do anyway. Hmm. Uh, we don't have the luxury, I think, of approaching our choices of what to, how to live our lives according to what seems like it will work at this point, because certainly if you have that calculation, you won't do much at all. Um, but rather, I think we have an imperative uh, to live um, our lives as best we can um, on behalf of, you know, taking care of our families, our communities, and our world. And and it can be enormously rewarding to do that. And whether or not we succeed. And the question, I guess, is that is that we have to confront our denial or confront our fears and work our way together through those things. Yeah, and I think you know we don't we don't really have a choice uh, but to do otherwise. And I think that living a you know all of us have a desire to live a meaningful life. You know, we actually have culturally a lot of grand narratives about coming up against insurmountable odds. Think about people like Joseph Conrad have to say about these kinds of things, about the the power of these mythic struggles. Well, we're, we're in one now, and uh, whether or not we uh, know what's going to happen next, it, it, it the most meaningful life that we can live can be one um, that is being engaged, and being engaged in our communities, being engaged in our schools, being engaged in our political institutions. Is there a uh, new book coming? Yes, I am just, it's not, it's very different than living in denial, but I have um, a, just finished a manuscript, um, and it'll be another year probably before it um, is entirely out, but the tentative title is Salmon Feeds Our People, and it is about the work I've been doing on the Klamath, and it's more speaking to the discipline of sociology, but it'll be broadly applicable about indigenous worldviews and traditional knowledge and what those have to contribute to the academia. Nice. I look forward to it. I guess the uh, the question I always like to ask last is, uh, is there something we haven't talked about that we should have? I mean, I think one, one thing that we didn't discuss is, you know, what it is that people can do and sort of the, 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 the situation that we're in, which is that no matter what we do, it, it will not feel like enough. And it it may in fact not be enough that we, when it comes to climate change, we are, we have to be cognizant on the one hand that we're talking about a very large collective problem that really does require, if not everyone to be mobilized, a large number of people to be mobilized. And, and from that point, all of us are in different social locations. And so there are different things that we can do. And in fact, there are many, many things that we can do. And so, you know, what, someone can do who is um, a teacher versus what someone can do who is um, works on a construction site or what someone can do you know who um, you know has access to to um, you know medical communities or or whatever the the social networks that we have and the kinds of political opportunities that we have because of those social networks are unique for each of us. But it does matter that people um, speak publicly, even having conversations with your friends um, or writing letters to the editor um, of newspapers. Anything that helps to make climate change visible helps us to have a richer conversation about uh, what what can be done and um, what needs to be done. And often starting in the local community can be very um uh, very valuable, you know, learning more about what climate impacts are predicted in your community and figuring out how to um, to think about how to mitigate those. And certainly, I think large-scale political action is very necessary, obviously, in the United States. Um, it really matters uh, what um, what's coming out of the White House in terms of uh, messaging and policy. Kari, I really want to thank you for taking time to join us today. It's been a uh, wonderful hour and uh, very informative. I wish you all the best in uh, in your newest book and uh, all your efforts. Thank you for bringing attention to an extremely important topic. And thanks to your listeners for everything that they're doing. Dr. Kari Norgard has been our guest today. She's the author of Living in Denial, Climate Change, Emotions, and Everyday Life. That's another edition of the Conversation Lab. 
This radio program and podcast is produced by CFRO-FM in Vancouver's downtown east side. We're on the territories of the Squamish, Musqueam, and tsleil Nations. Our gratitude and thanks to them, as well as to the many not-for-profit organizations, community groups, and change makers around the world that support this program. If you enjoyed today's conversation, please consider becoming a member of Co-op Radio to support this program and the many others produced by hundreds of volunteers. If you have a story to share or know someone who does, please have them contact us at coopradio.org, theconversationlab.ca, and on many social media and podcasting platforms. This episode was cobbled together with some help from Brian McKinnon, Kimmet Sakon, John Massacar, and Julian Anton. Thanks, guys, and thank you for listening. I'm Don Schaefer.